Is my screen visible? Yes, you are visible. Yes, yes you are visible. visible. Sorry, screen, screen. Yeah, yeah. It's visible. Go ahead. Yeah. I hope audio is clear. Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Hormone India team, for having me here. My privilege to be here. And today I'll be talking on uh, resistant prolactinoma because uh, we see many cases of uh, prolactinoma. Those normally usually they respond well to the dopamine agonist. If you come to the prolactinoma, they usually uh, uh, constitute around fifty percent of the all pituitary adenomas. They are most common uh, cause of the pituitary adenomas, secretory adenomas. And uh, if you see the majority of the patients, up to around eighty percent of the patients usually responds to the dopamine agonist, and uh, few cases so resistant to these conventional dopamine agonists. Some patients actually respond to, uh, I mean, respond poorly to one dopamine agonist. But when we change this dopamine agonist from one drug to other, they may respond well. And some patients may initially respond well, but later they may not show that response, and uh, later they may be drug resistant. And also, this is called a term called selective resistance. That means this will be discordance in uh, prolactin lowering and decrease in the tumor size. That means in terms of normal hyper, uh, normal prolactin levels, I mean they may achieve the normal prolactin levels, but the tumor size may not reduce or vice versa. And uh, the, coming to the term drug resistant, usually normally defined as uh, when you use the adequate drug at appropriate dose, and if the patient is Very good tolerance. Patient is tolerant to the drug, and he maintains good compliance. But in spite of all that, if we are not able to achieve the therapeutic targets, then we can call it as a drug resistant. So it usually is a spectrum from full sensitivity to the full resistance. In in between, there will be partial responders also. Uh, coming to the uh, definition of resistant prolactinoma, actually there is no uh, universal agreement on the definition because uh, previously they have used the several criteria coming from the I mean. Starting from the normalization of prolactin levels, few studies have they used the 50% reduction in the prolactin levels, and few studies actually uh, take the criteria like to reduce the prolactin level to sufficiently cause uh, ovulation. But it's in the practical setup, it's very difficult to uh, like confirm the onset of I mean uh, cons uh, confirm the ovulation. So by and large, we are now using the failure to normalize the prolactin levels as the proper criteria. when it comes to the micro prolactinoma but when it comes to the macro prolactinoma because it can cause compression and enlargement and compression of the optic chiasma where we have to use both uh, normalization of prolactin and significant reduction in the tumor size so what is the significant reduction in the tumor size because uh, when we start patient on dopamine agonist in a patient of prolactinoma usually there, there are multiple studies have shown uh, i mean starting from 30 to 80% of the shrinkage in the tumor some patient i mean some patient may respond completely the disappearance of tumor may be possible because the risk of compression mainly depends upon the tumor extension to the optic chiasma the appropriate criteria will be uh, decrease in the tumor height that is around some studies have taken uh, some guidelines mention 30% some guidelines mention 50% by but and large by we will take 50% reduction in the tumor height as a significant reduction in the tumor size so overall the resistant to dopamine agonist is defined as failure to achieve normal prolactinemia Under maximally tolerated doses, when they are used for at least three to six months, together with a uh, lack of decrease in the tumor height, in, uh, when it comes to the micro micro prolactinoma. Into the prevalence, the resistance is more frequent in cases of macro prolactinoma compared to the micros. Overall, for cabergolin, the resistance is less, ten to twenty percent, ten percent in case of micro prolactinomas, twenty percent in case of macro prolactinomas. But when it comes to the bromocriptin, it is little higher. Uh, it is twenty percent in case of micro and thirty uh, percent in case of macro prolactinoma. And uh, there is no strict tool uh, to which uh, to say that beyond this dose we can call it as a resistant because uh, some there are many studies starting from point five mg per week to like there are studies they use maximum twenty one mg also. But usually accepted guidelines, I mean accepted uh, dose equivalents uh, between the several uh, dopamine agonists beyond which we can call it as a uh, resistant is uh, more than 15 mg of bromocriptin per day. That is because bromocriptin has very short half life compared to the cabergolin. Cabergolin has a half life of around 64 hours. So that's why we give once in a week or twice a week. But bromocriptin ideally we have to give daily. So more than 15 mg of bromocriptin per day or more than 2 mg of Cabergolin per week. Usually, we take it as a uh, standard. In one study, uh, by the 
Del Grange et al. Uh, out of 122 patients with macroprolactinoma, almost 80% of the patients achieved normal prolactin levels with cabergolin of less than 1.5 mg per week. In 15%, they respond also. Uh, uh, the 15% of the patients required 2 to 7 mg per week, but only 6% of the patients could not achieve the medical control despite increasing the doses to at least on an average of 3.5 mg per week. So when it comes to the mechanism of uh, dopamine resistance, uh, dopamine agonist resistance, uh, before going to that, we all know that uh, dopamine receptors are like two family of us. D1-like receptors, uh, D1 and D5, and D2 family receptors. D in that, D2 receptor, D3, D4 receptors will be there. And D1 receptor, D1-like receptors actually acts by uh, stimulating the GS alpha and thereby increasing the cyclic AMP production and protein protein kinase activation. So these D1-like receptors actually stimulates the prolactin secretion. But D2-like receptors, uh, they act through the uh, a G alpha I and inhibit the site production of the cyclic AMP and protein kinase A, thereby decrease inhibit the prolactin secretion. And in so all these dopamine agonists act through these D2 receptors, thereby decreasing the prolactin secretion. When it comes to the D2 receptors, again, there are two isoforms. Uh, these isoforms form by alternative splicing, like short isoform and long isoform. We call it a D2S and D2L. The dopamine effects on lactotropes are mediated through the D2, yes, D2 small uh, isoform receptor. So that's why in patients who have a decreased expression of this D2S receptor or imbalance between the D2S and D2L, that means lesser production of D2S with increased production of D2L, plays an important uh, role in uh, development of resistant prolactin. As I said, uh, and also the other uh, mechanisms by how they develop a resistance are decreasing the dopamine receptor expression and uh, downstream signaling pathways and reduction in MRA levels of inhibitory G protein alpha subunit. And other, uh, 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 other action, other mechanism is disruption of the growth hormone uh, growth factor signaling. That means increased growth, growth factor signaling, which usually uh, mediated by the uh, epithelial growth factor receptors or nerve growth factor receptors. Ultimately, they act through the tyrosine kinase receptors and increase the proliferation. And one more thing is the TGF beta system. Actually, uh, these have a role in the induction of dipomene agonist resistance. There is a significant reduction of the TGF beta 1 and also downstream intracellular uh, effectors like SMAD proteins reported in uh, human dopamine agonist resistant prolactinoma. So this dopamine usually upregulate this TGF beta system and estrogens downregulate TGF beta. Uh, system. So if you see here, one is the do, uh, dopamine uh, recept D2 receptor, like uh, D2 receptors, they'll mediate, they mediate action through the G alpha inhibitory. They, one side, it will inhibit the AKMP production. So one side, it inhibits the PA3 AKT MTAR pathway. So there will be a decrease in the proliferation and promotes the apoptosis. And one more is the TGF beta system. TGF beta also actually through SMAD proteins, it negatively regulates the prolactin, I mean, prolactin secretion. So when there is a, I mean, when there is a, a decreased, I mean, uh, down regulation of this TGF beta system, then the patient may develop dopamine agonist resistance. And third one is, this. as I said, epithelial growth factor receptors act through the tyrosine kinase pathway. They'll also, the increased expression or increased activity of these receptors leads to the uh, dopamine agonist resistance because these receptor tyrosine tyrosine kinase receptors also modulate the D2 receptor action. So, so what are the risk factors for resistant prolactinoma? I mean, those these patients, of male, male patients are increased uh, are increased risk of developing resistant prolactinoma and very young patients, cystic tumors, are at increased risk, large tumors, invasive prolactinoma, prolactinoma associated with men's syndromes, they are all uh, increased risk for resistant prolactinoma. And coming, back, coming to the management, there are uh, options are first, uh, to, if patient is on, first step is a uh, shift to cabergoli. Suppose if the patient is on bromocriptine, then we have to shift to the cabergolin. But uh, those, if patient is already in cabergolin, then uh, there is no point in actually changing to bromocriptine because the cabergolin is more efficacious compared to the bromocriptine. And 80% uh, of the usually 60 to 80% of the bromocriptine resistant patients achieve normal prolactin levels using cabergolin. But in these patients, those who are resistant to bromocriptine, then compared to the normal patients, these patients may require higher dose of cabergolin. 
then second is uh, second aspect is cyber uh, bullet dose escalation so and we see partial resistance of to dopamine agonist if you should normally often uh, overcome by the increasing the dose of the dopamine i mean cabergoli in one study by ono et al this study of 150 previously untreated patients uh, in that one third are macroidomas they able to report they reported normalization of prolactin levels with less than 2 mg per week in uh, almost all patients except 11 patients in that also uh, more than 2 mg per week was required in 11 patients uh, that means four patients required 3 mg two patients required 6 mg four required 9 mg and one patient required 12 mg but one patient did not respond even with uh, 15 mg of uh, cabergolin 15 mg per week of cabergolin so as long as the adverse effect did not develop, do not develop the dose escalation remains in a good therapeutic option but patient must be informed about the potential long term side effects of the cabergolin at such high doses uh, in particular of the risk of uh, cardiac valvular and pleural fibrosis but more than this actually what we need to focus more is the risk of impulsive control disorders that we always will think like a uh, screen uh, if, if a patient is we are giving a high doses of cabergolin then we always focus on the heart risk of fibrosis risk of pleural fibrosis but more common than that is the risk of impulse control disorders so always that's why uh, though these patients may have may develop hypersexuality these patients may develop uh, uh, increased gambling behavior so financially the patients may deteriorate or their marital relationships may get disturbed so always always when especially when you you are giving more than 2 mg per week of cabergolin always discuss these possible side effects with the patient and also the spouse otherwise if you don't inform the side effects to the patient or other spouse then when patient patient develop these kind of hypersexuality or gambling behavior they just they they may not know that it's because of the drug so that may disturb their family and financial relations so that's why i always uh, inform about this impulse control disorders in fact in patients uh, i mean patients taking dopamine agonist daily in the case of parkinson disease these impulse control disorders are reported to be around 60% but because prolactinoma we usually tend to use lesser doses the uh, around the 5 to 10% is the uh, um, uh, development of risk of development of these impulse control disorders but when you are using higher doses then the risk will be more so that's why always you need to discuss these side effects and some studies have shown little benefit beyond 3.5 mg per week so maintaining this maximal dose and waiting for the time i mean a watchful waiting may lead to hormonal control after several months and next option is the surgery patient who are resistant to medical treatment or who require higher than the standard doses of cabergolin not tolerating and especially with optic hyacinthal compression because this is the thing uh, that is more important than just hyperprolactinemia and all so then these patients may get benefited from the neurosurgery even though tumor resection is incomplete so because just we can do a debulking surgery then followed by continuing the cabergolin dose then they may respond well uh, than without surgery then uh, the transpenoidal or microscopic or endoscopic approach uh, we uh, do uh, do well for the microprolactinoma majority of the macroprolactinoma but those patients who have giant tumors or with intracranial extension then the craniotomy could be the option next is the radiotherapy this those patients who are resistant to medical therapy but fail surgical therapy but still exhibit an aggressive uh, behavior uh, threatening i mean compression the optic chiasma then maybe uh, uh, radiotherapy can effectively control the tumor growth but the problem with radiotherapy we all know that it require many years and uh, following the non curative or debulking surgery both conventional fractionated radiotherapy or stereotactic radio surgery stereotactic radio surgery we need to be a bit careful when especially if the tumor is close to the optic chiasma then in those cases we usually go for the conventional fractionated rt and this therapy allows normalization of prolactin levels at similar rates of around 20 to 40% but the delay is the problem this may take up to 3 to 10 years but along with this after radiotherapy if you continue the medical therapy then prolactin normalization may be finally obtained in 80 to 90% of the patients and next is the uh, chemotherapy like temozolomide is the uh, av- uh, widely available drug now and it's a orally alkylating agent highly effective in aggressive neuroendocrine tumors or carcinomas or prolactinomas the dose usually advise a 150 mg per med square od for 5 days in a month like that six cycles you have to give but before every cycle you have to check for the cytopenia because neutropenia and uh, thrombocytopenia are very common 
So this is the algorithm. Uh, first drug resistant macroplacanoma, then switch to the drug, then increase the doses of the drug. Here the recommendations are there are uh, suggesting to go up to 3.5 mg per week, but beyond that, maybe the side effects, maybe side effects will be more, but the response may not be that good. Then uh, if still resistant, then especially if symptoms, complications, large tumor, compressing the optic chiasma or planning pregnancy, very engaged, then better to go for this debulking surgery. After debulking surgery, then again, you have to initiate this patient on cabergolin, then watch for the control. If there is still no control, then to go for the radiotherapy. If after radiotherapy, then temozolomide is also a good option. So in this perspective, I want to, I mean, uh, discuss, I mean, uh, just uh, one case we have seen uh, in our uh, institute names, Hyderabad, recently. Uh, it's a 36-year-old male presented with headache, a diminished vision in the right eye. And MRI showed 7 centimeters LR mass with optic diastinal compression. Uh, I think I'll go to the correct right, slide. Yeah. In 2004, he was the initial presentation. He was not following with, uh, at the time, he was not with us. He was consulted outside a uh, uh, doctor. Proactin levels, he presented with headache, the ring of vision. Then uh, directly they would done an MRI scan, showed 7 into 7 into 6 centimeter cellar mass. And proactin levels are more than 10,000. Uh, doctor, because it's compressing the uh, chiasma and also visual field defects were there, they had done the surgery followed by radiotherapy. Then after that, he lost follow for four years. Then again came to us in 2018 February. Then prolactin levels were uh, high, and but to MRI uh, MRI actually uh, showed good response. Once one into one into I mean one into one point nine into point seven centimeters. So because we are not sure about his complaints, then we started point five mg per week. Then gradually escalated to two mg per week. Then uh, within one year he showed good response uh, with prolactin normalization. But again after six months. Again, the prolactin levels started increasing. We, we confirmed the, a good compliance. Then when we repeated the MRI, MRI showed increase in the tumor size from 1 to 3.7 centimeter. Then here, uh, because it was, again, this time he developed left-sided decreased uh, vision. Then uh, MRI showed uh, compressing the optic chiasma. So we, have, we proceeded with the repeat surgery. And after six months, uh, again, uh, with 3 mg per week, he showed very good response with the uh, Prolactin levels of 50. Then after 12 months post follow-up, again, the tumor started increasing. Prolactin levels were increased. And with 3 mg per week also, we are not able to achieve the normal prolactin. Yes. Then at this point, we consider because it's again, tumor is growing, then again, the uh, chance of uh, compression of the optic asthma is there. So we started temozolomide at this point. We gave uh, five days in a month for six months. Then after uh, six months, he showed very good response with the prolactin of 20 and tumor decreased by almost 50% with 2 mg per week, we could achieve this uh, target. And at this point, temozolomide was stopped. Even after six months after stopping temozolomide with 2 mg per week, we showed very good response. Tumor size, actually I did not mention here, it was 1.5 centimeter and with normal prolactin levels. So other follow available options are close follow-up in older males, postmenopausal women with no symptoms and no threat of compression. If fertility is major concern, then induction of ovulation uh, using clomiphene citrate is a good option. But the pregnancy, the SAR has already extensively discussed. That because estrogen uh, promotes the growth of the, these tumors, though tamoxifen, fulvestrin, anastazole are the drugs actually tried, but uh, just not usually recommended. What are the future potential therapeutic options? Uh, as I discussed in the mechanism, the tyrase and kinase inhibitors has a role. They are definitely going to have a role in the, uh, controlling the tumor. Uh, Lapartanib, Jepitinib already tried. And combining tabergolin with octreotide because these receptors are uh, very well expressed in some resistant prolactinoma. And peptide receptor nu radionuclide therapy also with indium DTPA octreotide has been uh, reported in the patient with giant uh, prolactinoma. And as I said, TGF beta system is involved in the dopaminergic inhibition of lactotropes. The thrombospondin is uh, uh, actually studied in animal models. But, so to conclude, most lactnomas respond very well, but showed some resistance or more resistance with the bromocriptin than cabergolin. The predictive factors were uh, invasiveness of the tumor and male gender. So in that case, need to change the uh, drug, escalate the drug, Wait for the long-term effects, surgical debulking, radiotherapy, followed by timozolomide. Despite all these options, few patients will remain hyperprolactinemic. But if they, as long as there is no compression, then we can manage this patient conservatively. And uh, maybe 
we uh, it's the time we need to focus more on the future uh, treatment options maybe we need to see how they going to act yeah, thank you and acknowledge uh, the uh, the department of endocrinology and department of neurosurgery in hyderabad thanks mm -hmm. for giving the opportunity